what you just saw was an expression of the physiology and ecology of the great whales, as interpreted through the music of Ian Lowe and the choreography of Suzanne Ostersmith and the dancers. Works like these that require radical collaboration, bringing together scientists, choreographers, composers, and dancers, is what I'm here to talk about today. I've built a career around doing things that I'm pretty good at. But today, I'm here to talk about how working together to get outside our comfort zones can help us get beyond our limitations and transform our work. I'm a scientist and an educator, and my research seeks to understand why and how we have so much beautiful biodiversity around us. For instance, those whales you just saw. And my teaching seeks to develop passion in my students for the natural world and to facilitate their learning so that they can go on and make their own impact, mostly through medicine, science, and teaching. We all have things that we're really good at. We have different aptitudes and experiences, but we can't be expected to be good at everything. Therefore, I suggest that to make transformational advancements, we should all be collaborating, working together with very different people in order to overcome the canalization of our own specializations. For an example, let me tell you about an experience of working with artists to communicate science. We as scientists usually communicate by telling people about science. Unfortunately, this is a terrible way of communicating. We lose people in the detail, in the abstract, even when what we have to say is important. But artists, choreographers and composers, painters and playwrights are experts at engaging our senses, manipulating us to feel, to be moved, to understand and to remember. And this is exactly what we want to be doing in science education. We're not really here to provide knowledge. What we want to do is make that knowledge make sense and to matter. To do powerful art, artists combine unusual aptitude with years of developed skills and practice and training. For instance, Suzanne Ostersmith is the director of the dance program at Gonzaga and among other things, is a gifted choreographer. Dance, as an art form, is one of the quintessential features of humanity. All human cultures dance. This is a way that we, as humans, have always communicated and expressed ourselves. So, to really communicate science, dance makes sense. So Suzanne and I decided to try to use dance to communicate ideas from my scientific research. For instance, we realized that processes such as evolution by natural selection can be communicated through representative movement, and that that provides a different understanding of that process. We can represent the shuffling of genes each generation and the generations of selection required to see changes. But a lot of work goes into art. We brought in a student composer, Ian Lowe, who tried to interpret biological processes into music. And then we created in the studio, working together to try movements and see if they communicated what we wanted them to. Sometimes we'd work on something for weeks, and it just wouldn't work, and we'd have to drop it. <laughs> but through this process, we came to realize that as biology is a set of moving, rhythmic, dynamic processes, Dance and music can be made to communicate this in a rich and detailed way. This experience transformed the way I understand communication and education. But the value of this sort of interaction can go both ways. When asked what she gets out of our collaboration, Suzanne says that artistic license is a wonderful tool, but in working with a scientist, so is accuracy. Through this process, we collaborated to find a balance between the two, and as a result, my understanding of biodiversity 
and appreciation for our shared skills grew. But this idea of doing transformative work by working with very different people doesn't only apply to artists and scientists. I found that my research is completely dependent on working with others as well. Scientific advancements are made by working with others to challenge our assumptions and to come up with new and creative ways of explaining the world. But it turns out that this just doesn't happen if we only interact with people that have the same background, training, and paradigms as ourselves. For another example of collaboration, educating out of the classroom doesn't have to mean the studio. In my teaching, I would love it if my students could learn physiology by experiences with challenging their own bodies. I'd love it if they could learn ecology by being out in the environment and seeing and touching and smelling it. Research suggests that this sort of experiential learning is one of the keys to engaging students from diverse backgrounds and to making that information really stick. The problem is that this is hard. <laughs> And I just don't have the skills to be able to make sure that students can function and be safe out in a wilderness environment. But luckily, there are people out there that do. This is Matt Edenfeld, and he's a program director in the Gonzaga Outdoors program. And Matt has years of experience and specialized training on how to manage groups and keep them safe in stressful, challenging outdoor situations. We find that by working together, by collaborating, to teach biology in context, the learning is deeper and more memorable. We find that the students learn to engage with the natural world beyond their intellectual understanding. They learn that they are part of the environment, and they learn how to work together to explore it. But the benefits of this interaction go both ways, too. When asked what he gets out of our collaboration, Matt says that working with a scientist adds another layer of learning application and transference to the interdisciplinary approach of experiential learning. Outdoor education is most effective when there's an interconnectedness between adventure pursuits, environmental inquiry, and character development. Both we as educators and the students are transformed by these experiences. Although my examples are mostly about education, that's just what I do, I think that this idea applies far beyond the context of teaching. I think that by radically collaborating, we can transform the way we solve problems. So I challenge each of you to reach out to people that are very different from you and to think expansively about how different experiences, backgrounds, and perspectives can change what you do. However, when I tell people about this collaborative work, they often say, well, that sounds really interesting, but I can't really imagine working so far outside my own field. So here are a few things that, in my experience, can help this work. The first is having humility. And for me, this has meant recognizing that although I teach for a living, I have an immense amount to learn about communicating and engaging. But humility is also a place of openness to learning and new experiences, and a recognition that, of course, we don't have all the answers. The second is that we really have to respect the skills and expertise of others. Just because I don't understand what you do doesn't mean that your skills don't have equal value to my own. In academics, like many fields, there's a tendency to overstate the value of our own expertise and to discount the value of others. But I suggest that we must really respect these differences, because it is the diversity of perspectives that allows us to fully explore our human experience. Finally, it takes just a little courage. And by that, I mean you have to be willing to take risks. You have to be willing to reach out to and interact with people that are very different from you. You have to be willing to do things differently than you've ever done them before. And you have to question the way you understand things. That dance collaboration I talked about earlier was scary for me. I don't understand the process of creating music or dance. 
the studio is not necessarily a comfortable place for me. I worried that I was wasting my time, that what we were creating would be silly or even ridiculous. But by taking these risks, we were able to create something that was new and different and that was effective at reaching people that I never could have reached alone. Humility, respect, and a little courage. In my experience, that opens the door to be able to tap into the amazing potential of others to transform our own work. So, to conclude, the dancers are going to show us a piece from our collaborative work that we use to demonstrate how diversity and process can lead to transformation. Thank you. <laughs> 